This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. You can go ahead and admit it to yourself. I won't judge you, because I'm, I'm as guilty as the next person, that it's nice when you have a substantial number of people like or follow something that you've posted on social media. For most of us, this revolves around a picture of a vacation or something the kids did or even just some random silliness that you happened across on the street or something like that. But what if one of your posts went viral? And I mean really viral. So much so that it resulted in you receiving so much feedback that you decided to start an organization to fulfill the need that you just uncovered. Well, this is exactly what happened to Anne Maria Olson, who is my guest for the 118th episode of the Terms of Reference podcast. As you'll hear in the episode, she wrote a post that launched a vibrant growing organization called Give Something Back to Berlin. This organization seeks to connect people in the city of Berlin, especially migrants who are looking for ways to thrive in a place that has welcomed them with open arms, but may not necessarily have given them all the resources that they need. Anna Maria is a Swedish journalist and writer who also has 10 years of NGO experience. And as you'll hear in just a moment, she tells you her story much better than I ever could. I spoke with Anna Maria in Berlin. And of course, if you like what you're hearing, please do take a moment to open up iTunes right now or whatever your podcast app happens to be and click on subscribe. That way you'll get the show every week in your inbox and you, you won't even have to think about it. Also consider giving the show a rating because it really does help us to spread the word and, and get it out there. And finally, please consider sharing this episode or the podcast in general on Facebook or Twitter to help others get in on making aid and development better. Thanks. Hello, Anna Maria. Thank you so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. Hello, Stefan. Very nice to be here. Anna Maria, where are you sitting? I mean, I know it's kind of obvious, but where are you sitting today? Well, it's kind of obvious. Uh, I uh, work for Give Something Back to Berlin. So I'm sitting in Berlin. I'm sitting uh, in our office. Uh, it's uh, situated in an integrated uh, refugee home where refugees live together with locals uh, uh, or Germans or, yeah, mixed with project spaces. And, um, yeah, I'm sitting here um, in front of my computer. So you work where other people live? Yeah. So, I mean, this house is five uh, stories high. So on uh, the two top floors, there are apartments where 40 people live. And uh, then on the main floor, it's this big uh, kind of cafe and co-working space and project spaces. And uh, yeah, and then there are uh, offices and stuff. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting mix. And on the, f uh, on the roof, there's a big rooftop terrace where people can just meet and hang out and enjoy the view over Berlin. And is this something that your project created? And uh, no, actually, it's uh, we were the first project to move in here, uh, the ex first external project. So uh, this uh, house is run by uh, two guys who are connected with like the city mission. So they kind of got free hands to dream up uh, this space, and their dream uh, project to have here was us. Uh, so we were the first one that they invited. So it's it's a great honor and it's a beautiful space. And we yeah, we, cre we create a lot of synergies in this house between the people who live here, but also with the people who come and go and the projects being done. And so we offer a lot. It's kind of a big uh, community house and we, we offer a lot of the activities here That's through our project. Uh, cool. Everything. It's cool. It's, it's such like the reverse of, you know, working from home like so many consultants do out in the world or so many, you know, freelance workers do. You're working in somebody else's home. But I don't want to go too far down that, that path. You said the name of your organization earlier. It's called Give Something Back to Berlin, which, yes. you know, sounds like a project name, but now it's an organization. Why don't we start out by you just telling us the story of how this organization became? What was its genesis? Well, it's kind of funny. It didn't really start or like there was no grand plan behind this organization. It actually started with me writing a very spontaneous Facebook post back in 2012 uh, where I addressed some things that I've been thinking about and uh, seeing. Um, I was working as a journalist um, back then and I was covering everything from like the rise of xenophobia in in the whole of Europe, I was also a migrant myself, a very privileged one from Sweden living in, in, 
in Germany, in Berlin, uh, but still a migrant, and I had experienced um, yeah challenges uh, and uh, being new in a country. And I saw that with a lot of uh, different groups. And uh, the third thing was, yeah, I saw that there was very little innovations and kind of practical tools to bring together different kinds of migrants and local communities and make them learn and share with each other and really make migrants being a positive uh, force and an actor in the city. And uh, so I wrote about a little bit about those things and about the urge and need maybe to actually do something uh, with the situation that we uh, that we have in Europe and also locally in our neighborhoods with a lot of segregation and sometimes mistrust, sometimes the prejudice. Um, and this uh, this Facebook post that I wrote actually became a snowball. It kind of went viral uh, and people started signing up to this Facebook post because they thought that this was an actual project that was... Uh, so you, but you, you unwittingly wrote a proposal, basically. Well, yeah I, yeah, I did. And I had not planned with this. That's with, this was no grand plan or anything. But it kind of striked me when so many people started sharing and started kind of signing up on this project that didn't exist. I was like, fuck, if like this, if so many people have the same feeling as I have, or like they have the same urge and they don't find an outlet for, you know, getting involved and creating something, then there's something wrong. Like then we should do something with this energy. And so after that, um, I kind of contacted some people who seemed the most eager and I said, okay, should we try to, you know, make something out of this and find a little model how to, yeah, do something out of this idea. And so we did and I thought, okay, yeah, you know, it will just be a little thing I can do on my side. And I was working as a journalist. I was writing my book and, and then this just grow, grew and grew and grew. And um, when we actually launched the concept that we developed one year later, it just took off immediately and yeah, became really big, very fast. So take us there. What, what is the concept? Tell, you know, give us the, the, the I details mean, of what what is it that you do like yeah it's a uh, it's for me it's really really not rocket science like it's so easy and I, for me it's so simple but so. that's sometimes the best ideas are the most simple ones. yeah i mean what we do is we created an english-speaking website where we offer volunteer possibilities uh for newcomers english speakers with english speakers i say or like non-german speakers uh in berlin and that's the one thing and then we also let those non-german speakers offer their skills to the city for different social causes so for instance oh i'm a i'm a syrian graphic designer i would like to help out with that or i'm um i'm an israeli uh, theater um, pedagogue uh, I would like to do a project together with kids or yeah it's like you offering your skills for a social cause in the city as yeah as a, as a newcomer and and that's a way for kind of to mobilize and um, newcomers and non-Berliners or non-Germans to act, become active uh, an active part of their communities and volunteer and with that, we've also wanted to send out a signal to the city and to, you know, ethnic Germans that actually different kinds of migrants, I sometimes call them uh, 50 shades of migrants, <laughs> that we actually have a lot to share with the city and that we want to be a positive force and can be if you just, you know, if you create an open space and offer it to so, us. So riddle me this, you, you know, we started our conversation with you telling me about the place that you work, this this five story house, that was, if I miss, if I understand it correctly, the two people who put it together were granted this from the city, from Berlin, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so it seems like there is a forward thinking, you know, welcoming, aware, at least bureaucracy or government there, and so how is it that gives something back to Berlin? sparked such a fire that it's you know it, it, this is something that was so necessary weren't these this wasn't found in other places of berlin or other places in germany 
Yeah, I think that uh, now a lot of a, a lot of things changed, um, like the last year or like the one and a half year. When we started this project... You mean specifically uh, like, tied to the migrant crisis uh, about a year and a half ago? Yes. Uh, yes, it's... Uh, I mean, it's a lot of things coming together. So uh, when we started this project, I mean, we were kind of a little bit before our time with addressing those issues. And actually, in the beginning, people... Some, you know, parts of, you know, the politicians and bureaucracy, they seriously did not understand what we were trying to do. And it was a little bit too, this was not like integration in the way that people kind of see it. It was not social innovation the way people normally do it. And um, yeah, we were just a little bit too <laughs> innovative. Uh, but then when, you know, this huge migrant crisis popped up uh, in the media like last year this we had an answer on actually quite a lot of questions uh, that was being asked and was being raised that being said Berlin is the city of a lot of kind of do-it-yourself culture um, and so you have a lot of people tend to People who, who seek them seek to come to Berlin, I mean, they're often quite politically aware and, you know, they're creative people with ideas. But a lot of this creativity and a lot of those ideas, it was hard to kind of mobilize them in to, to actually become social good. Um, they were often ending up in kind of creative projects or, you know, floating around in different kind of expat bubbles or startup bubbles. So what we really wanted to do is to kind of take some of this creative international cosmopolitan energy and really push them into local social projects and to create synergies there. And, and, my, and, my, and my understanding is that it's completely volunteer driven, right? That's your... That's your investment capital, really, at the end of the day, is that you're, re you're relying on people to volunteer their time, right? Yeah, completely insane numbers of uh, volunteering. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, it's very beautiful, actually, what this uh, very easy website built up. Because um, when we started, like, uh, yeah, we, we started up sending volunteers to already existing organizations as a as a way to kind of not reinvent the wheel and just create more segregation but really kind of yeah that the newcomers or the new Berliners actually go into the already existing structures for them also to get to know us but we kind of soon realized that that was not enough like the innovation did not happen there and we had too much interest from our people and our community to get involved so we actually started um, very early to develop projects of our own to really kind of use the creativity and the skills that exist among our people and our community and only in those um, we have nine weekly projects and per year that's like over 20,000 volunteering hours Mm -hmm. per year and we reach uh, like over 14,000 participants with these programs excellent so, that's, so uh, yeah so, that's so give me give me an example like maybe pick one or two of your favorite projects that are going on right now or, or happened in the past that you think really sort of tell the story or embody what giving back you know give something back to berlin is all about yeah, I mean, one of our oldest projects that we actually started in 2013 was um, also a super easy concept. Uh, it was a refugee cooking group. We brought together, um, we connected with like refugee, self, self-organized self refugee initiatives um, and asked, uh, they were super isolated. They were, uh, you know, doing a protest in the city. Nobody cared. And we were like, okay, so can we do something together? We are a lot of open-minded um, people who want to get involved. And they were like, yeah, yeah, let's, uh, we actually, we would like to have the possibility to cook our own food because we can't do it in the refugee homes. And we would like to connect more with people and get to know other people in the city. We were like, okay, let's do this. So we started doing weekly cookings uh, with refugees together with yeah, non-refugees to just create meeting points and community through food, getting to know each other's cultures. And yeah, this uh, developed since then, and this project is still running. And today 
we do a lot of like street food events it's actually like a lot of the people who've been involved like the chefs they now work at we were uh, cooking with the philharmonic this weekend we like cool street food markets so this who this project was a lot about like creating community and stuff had also uh, developed into actual you know pe- creating job opportunities creating professional network for people and stuff so and that's been running yeah almost uh, more than three years now so it's it's kind of this development like it cre- it starts with you know something small something people coming together and uh, creating community and uh, getting to know each other and then from this like huge things grows and uh, it's kind of an illustration of how we're working that it's it's developing developing with the people who are coming in and mm. yeah so when, um, I, when i when i'm listening to you tell this i mean it it sounds like such a simple story. You're like, hey, there's some a group of people who are isolated, having some trouble. You know, these these refugees, and and you're, you, it's like you called them on the phone. And you're like, hey, what? Why don't we cook together? And they were like, yay! And then and then you get some people together. And you, it can't have been that easy. What's the special sauce you're bringing to the table with give something back to Berlin? Is it just the energy? Is it is it the openness? Is it the willingness? Is it do you have a huge network of people that you're calling upon? Like, what do you think are the factors that are making you successful where, you know, otherwise it would have just sort of fallen on deaf ears? Yeah, I think and another example of one of our projects is the, the open art shelter project that we're doing. It's an, it's an art, uh, it's an art concept. And there we actually work inside of refugee homes uh, and we do a lot of different art activities and stuff. And, and what I think there and what I think all our projects makes all our projects rather successful is actually that we have a mixed group of volunteers. So almost 80% so of all our volunteers. So it's not just Berliners showing up or ethnic Germans, you're saying it's... No. Okay. No, mm-hmm. exactly. So it's really people with migrant background. It's people like me. I've been in Berlin for eight years, but I'm still a new Berliner. I'm not ethnically German. I, I had to go through the same stuff. I had to learn German. Maybe my German is not perfect enough. I do grammatical mistakes or whatever. But those kind of mixed groups makes you feel it's not kind of traditional helping you know like you talk to people who maybe been through similar experiences or uh, you know it's not like a, a German person coming who wanting to help you but like you get soaked up in this network of a lot of international you know uh, volunteers or people in a community who who try to help each other in different ways. And that makes, I think, a lot of people feel that they're a little bit more on the same level. And there's not those strict barriers uh, between us and them. And also because we really, yeah, we really work hard to build up community, to build up trust and uh, with the people who we are working with. Like, and I don't know. I, it just, but I think this is one of the crucial things, and that's also what people are saying. That, you know, I feel I feel at home. Like I feel I'm not I'm not othered uh, by people, mm, and I'm mm-hmm. seen as I'm. So yeah, and also I think what it's because we often go in and we don't have this uh, might sound uh, <laughs> uh, for some people like horror, but. We're very flexible. When we go into a new, like, refugee shelter or we somebody, like to, for instance, with this uh, key, um, food project, we didn't have a grand master plan when we went in. We had, you know, we asked around, like, what do you want? Like, what is lacking? Or So we actually developed the project with the people and actually some of the ideas we had maybe from the beginning, we just skipped them the first day. We're like, okay, no, so this was not interesting or sorry yeah all of those mm-hmm. volunteers actually so you don't go in with the set like we have to do we all have to cook curry today you know we're so also and uh, for instance that way you build up a lot of new ideas pop up for instance like if we we work in one of the roughest refugee homes it's, it's really like it's really one of the worst in in berlin and maybe even in germany i don't know but like you can't go in there and have a fixed every Monday we're going to do this 
because that's really pe people inside of there there might have like a really rough week behind them like they might be tired like the children might be screaming around you just have to be flexible in what how you're dealing with the situation and that's also something that you have to train your volunteers to be because it's also of course frustrating and that is also the beauty of it that that you can really kind of be flexible with the idea be flexible with what you're doing and also then you can have volunteers who you know, uh, come in and they they can be like, oh, I'm actually only going to be here three months in Berlin. But those three months, I can do a lot. Like I can build, I can do this. I'm a um, poet. I want to do three months of like poetry workshop. And then you can come in and really do that. And and uh, yeah, so it's hard to keep up with everything. I was just going to say, it, what it's, what's, what's happening in my brain right now as I'm listening to you, it's, you know, because you have the network effect through your your online tools and, and whatnot. I mean, you know, people can propose projects on their own and they can grow it. So it, it really has this sort of knock-on effect, this network effect of, you know, people able, they're able to start their own things. Do you allow people that flexibility through your platform where, you know, if, if I were to show up today and say, hey, you know, I want to go give guitar lessons to someone. I could just sort of start that and make it forward, or do you have a process that they have to go through with your organization? Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of... Um, you can absolutely come and propose that, and then we'll see, okay, is there other people uh, in our community, in our network, who are interested in the same thing? Or, like, can we put you together with uh, those people so maybe you can, you know, develop a little concept? So that's, like, a super big part of our uh, work, that we act as this catalysator and this network. I was so say, you may, to you may have just named one of your special sauces for us, is that this isn't a passive network. This is a very actively managed network. Yeah, there's so much things happening within our network that it's, I mean, we don't, we can't keep up, you know, like, like uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I bumped into a girl, she was like, oh, and she's a choreographer and she met a, psychi a psychiatr psychologist and a choreographer in our network. And then they connected and they started, you know, developing a concept and they got now EU funding for this and are doing it in several countries. And I was like, oh, that's nice. You know, I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, we have like companies that started because like refugees connected with people in our network and they got together and they started to develop something. People get jobs. People Come on, take me there. Who's been married because of it? How many marriages have you had? No marriages yet. Any, uh, any kids? No, um, no. <laughs> just playing. Uh, yeah, I mean, almost. We're almost there. <laughs> it's going to be really interesting to see because we had uh, we had two people who got engaged, and like it's it's a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of of course couples and uh, stuff like that happening. What I think is really interesting is is yeah, this thing so, just yes. that when when people come together and just. And this is what's also lacking, like for refugees when they're coming. They don't have any natural ways into the society and community. They get like German lessons and then in German, you're obsessed with them getting a job. But seriously, that's not the end of it, you know. And how are you going to get a job and how are you going to learn German if you don't have any connections with the, yeah, with the society? That's like complicated <laughs> mm -hmm. a facebook post turned into an idea turned into a project turned into a a flourishing organization what's next what are you know what are you, what's the future hold for you have you are you able to plan out the next couple of years or is it still day to day or or uh, you know, you're, yeah, you're kind of still drinking it from a fire hose or what <laughs> i'm actually uh, we're actually sitting today and doing a, a year plan and but this is a luxury for us now because the last year was so insane. Like being in Berlin, being in Germany during like one year of refugee crisis. Like it, I mean, it was, yeah, it was intense. Let's put it that way. So there was a lot of being in this complete reactive mode. It's not only organization, obviously, like, you know, every country in Europe, every city, we all had to learn how to deal with this new situation so now it kind of got a little bit yeah um it's not as hectic so it gives us a little bit more space to actually plan ahead and be a bit more strategic and uh, yeah also because we had 
we did this uh, work also before this last refugee crisis. So that ha makes us, we have three years of experience uh, of this, so we can also evaluate to see, okay, what works, what not. And yeah, it's not just brainchild projects. It's a lot of, um, the last year has been a lot of uh, projects popping up with, that is a bit, you know, like brainchild projects, I call them, where people just, sit down with a couple of friends and they're like oh we have this great idea maybe we should do an app for refugees doing this and that and you know they had they have very little relationship to really reality mm, or, yeah mm -hmm. yeah it can, it can actually be now that you've you have a little breathing room and uh, i know I'm, I'm lucky enough to know that you just got back from holidays like have you had time to reflect like what are the biggest challenges i i, I can You've enumerated some of them, just, you know, I mean, just going into the, the refugee centers themselves and, and kicking these things off and having the energy to be flexible. But what, what are the other challenges that you've found getting this going? What, what have been your major hurdles? Yeah, I mean, as f I think for every project or every every uh, social enterprise or, I mean, in the beginning, it's, of course, always funding. But we have double because we are a project for migrants and from the migrants. And uh, we have, we kind of grew organically and from a more like grassrooty thing, which does, like Germany is not used to working in this way. Uh, in Germany, you sit down, you write a plan, and uh, you wait a year and then you start implementing the plan. This is completely the other way around. Yeah, which was really a big challenge for us. But that's also was a part of the chance because we wanted to change this. It can't be. You can't plan for everything. Like this non-flexible way of working is not working uh, for the participants. It's not mm -hmm. working. It's not a modern way of, you know, dealing with those situations. So, and I think that also Germany kind of realized that like last year. Uh, you can't p p write project proposals and sit and wait one and a half years before you get the money sorry like the situation is now we have to ask act now then of course i think there's the big challenge now will also be to un make uh, germany and europe understand what is actually integration like in as i said before integration is not only giving a head of your like um, a roof over your head a little bit of like german course and you know job coaching it's a lot, lot more, and uh, and what I call kind of soft integration, and that doesn't mean assimilation, but it really means uh, means yeah, building up, you know, trust between people, building up connections between people, and uh, to kind of work on prejudice and like getting to know each other in in who in the in the city in the communities, and this is something it's hard it's very hard to measure how mm -hmm. to do this. And what you can't measure, Germany, they loves to measure things. I mean, everyone loves to measure things, but it's much easier to say, oh, we had 35 people going through our professional mentoring program than saying, oh, we have a couple of hundred people every week attending our activities, getting to know people, you know, just creating... Community. In intangible connection, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, this will, yeah, this is a challenge to kind of convince people that maybe actually this is even more needed. Have you seen some of these challenges been assuaged at this point? I mean, have you, are you starting to break through? Are you starting to get noticed by like, by the government, by other, you know, by the German society? I get, you know, I'm, I'm not even sure who you're outside target audience would be to, you know, the, the behavior change you're trying to seek. Um, but have you started to see that ceiling be cracked? I'm not sure yet. I mean, we have a lot Fair of... Enough. It will. I think this will take a, a little bit, maybe a couple of years. I mean, we have a lot of people, like politicians interested in our project. And we have like the Minister of Integration and Refugees coming to visit us next week. We have like the mayor of Neukölln, where, we, uh, where we're situated. Um, but it's also for the politicians to really, you know, invest funds in this kind of you know, soft type of immigration and not only this kind of super heavy, you know, job integration, this kind of thing. Because it's also, and also another challenge is, of course, we don't work only with refugees. Yeah, we have like 
over 40 uh, nationalities working in our project and you could see what happened like with Brexit and stuff like we need to change the way migration is seen you know and create acceptance and show how good migration or how you can good solutions for for migration and that's that it's not only about refugees it's really not if you stare ourselves blind at refugees then we will have a lot more brexits and stuff uh, happening i think mm. so how do you fund this you said that you know funding was your biggest challenge in the beginning you said you've you've managed to to to, to grow and then grow your funding as well who Who's giving you money for this? Is this private donors? Is this, you know, have, have you created a fund somehow endowment? Like what, what's going on? Yeah, we, um, it's been mostly uh, private donors, partnerships with uh, companies. And, uh, but in the first years it was only private donors. And that was also intentional first because we didn't want to get too, you know, involved uh, and too tied up because how the funding system looked like in Germany. Like it's then we would have shooting ourselves in the foot because it would have created so much administrative, like bureaucracy around it. So the, the project would never have been so big if we had done that in the beginning. So I'm actually happy we didn't do that. It was like a lot of struggles, of course. Um, but we had like actually some good social investors also who really believed in the project that we met our second year and um, now we also um, have gotten kind of institutional a bit of institutional funding for the next uh, two years to stabilize the whole uh, structure and so we can actually plan uh, so we I think like our funding model it's a it's a mix of private partnerships, uh, um, donors, and yeah, hopefully also in the future, a bit more governmental uh, money to kind of stable it up, but mm. to really have both. And do you think there is something special about Berlin, the situation, the timing that, that is is driving your success? Or is this a model that you think can be packaged and exported or packaged in essentially franchise to other cities, other areas of the world. What do you think about that? I think uh, both, yes and no. I think like Berlin, we know that we can package and sell this elsewhere or like that this can be implemented elsewhere. We also, we had uh, like Council of Europe was here and they chose us like best practice uh, in Europe. They had been traveling around all over Europe to look at like integration projects. Yeah, we won the Intercultural Innovation Award from UNAOC and BMW. Like we had several cities approaching us wanting to learn from our model and stuff. So of course we, we know that there's some there's a model and we have we really have expertise how to do things but of course you also have to adjust it a bit then depending on where you go because the situation is also different in every city or in every country but of course berlin is a very special city in that sense that we i don't think we, yeah maybe we couldn't have develop this and try it out uh, so much try to do so much trial and error as we did the last four years if it wasn't for Berlin because it's yeah we did this with very little money with huge uh, do-it-yourself uh, spirit and I, I was living on almost no money and that's in a lot of European capitals uh, or around the world that's not possible and you can still do that in Berlin I think so mm. The last two questions I have for you are, are ones that I ask, or I try to ask every everyone on the, on the show right now. And that's the, the first one is: I know that you have a hectic schedule. You have, you know, you've been literally, you know, sort of burning the candle on three or four ends over the last couple of years. But who do you pay attention to? I would guess probably the I can answer the own question, but who do you pay attention to? And I'm thinking blogs, personalities, magazines, but whatever you know, media outlets that you listen to 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 get ideas, to be inspired, to to look at trends. I actually don't read much about what I'm doing. And what I'm trying to do is the opposite. Like, I really try to shut off and kind of, I read books. I try to read novels. I try to meet people who have nothing to do with my work or those kind of topics, but to really 
you know, get a bit of reality check and not to get too caught up in what I'm doing. I think it's, I think when you, when you work with this, you know, kind of heavy topics and being involved in those things, like I think it's very important to, you know, look elsewhere for inspiration, like go to a museum, I, like go to an art museum, go see an exhibition that has nothing to do with what you're doing. Yeah, I think that's what I'm trying to do. And I also, I write myself, I write literature, and that's a little bit to look inside and to kind of digest everything that you're doing because it's really kind of information overload. You meet people all the time, you hear those stories, from all over like you have you're updated with everything that's happening in the world and i think one of the major problems that people have and i've seen that over the last years is that people get too caught up and they get sucked into this universe and they get burned out so we really try to create spaces for the people working with us but also for myself personally where there should be absolutely nothing to do with you know the big issues of our time and refugees and crises there and brexits and stuff but yeah kind of space for for other things mm. <laughs> all good answers last question for you is is there something that you either have discovered through Give Something Back to Berlin or maybe in some of these creative moments or just, you know, random conversations with people, something super cool that you, you know, it, it could be a gadget, it could be a process, it could be an idea, it could be an event that is not related to what you do at all, but is something that you think the world should know about? What I think is really cool and what I, I see it every day is just like how much cool things can come out of just two people meeting each other from two different cultures mm -hmm. or like it also sounds super cheesy but the amount of cool things and uh, that can come out of that is just amazing and uh, I, I get it proven almost like every week so it's it's a very lo-fi uh, non-high-tech answer but that's pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> Anna Maria, you have been a delight. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us on the Terms of Reference podcast today. Thank you so much for uh, letting me talk and share, Stefan. You've been listening to the Terms of Reference podcast from Aidpreneur.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Yay!